Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. This is Emily from Smart Edition Academy. In this video, we are going to review the organization of the human body. We're going to go over the levels of organization, body cavities, tissues, homeostasis, and feedback mechanisms. This is all really important information to know for the HESI A2, so stay tuned. There are three there are three links that I'd like to share with you in the description below. The first is to a free diagnostic HESI A2 practice test. At the end of the test, it will allow for you to see your strengths and your weaknesses within each subject matter. That way you can kind of know where you should absolutely be focusing and starting at. Our HESI a2 full online course comes with everything that you need to pass the HESI A2, so I definitely recommend you checking it out. Now, without further ado, here is your free lesson on the organization of the human body for the science section of the HESI A2 from Smart Edition Academy. Enjoy. If we're going to be looking at the anatomy and physiology of the human body, we should probably know what it consists of. Let's look at the following diagram. Now keep in mind, as we progress through this diagram, each level of organization can be further evaluated and further divided into different components or subcategorized. For now, we are going to use this as a broad rundown of what comprises an organism, or us. As you can see in our diagram, an organism is comprised of many different structures at different levels, beginning with the atom. Atoms comprise of even smaller components that contribute towards its overall charge or energy levels. Depending on those charges, atoms are considered reactive and can combine together in different combinations to form molecules. One notable example of an everyday molecule is water. Water is an element made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one element of oxygen, hence its commonly known name of H2O. Molecules can combine together to create structures that make up a cell, the smallest unit of living matter. But aren't atoms our smallest unit of matter? Yes. Atoms are scientifically known as the smallest unit of matter, but cells are the smallest unit of living matter because it is the basic functional unit of life. There are a variety of cells that are classified based on their appearances and functions. When cells are similarly structured and packed together, they comprise a unit called a tissue, which allow for them to carry out a specific function which we will expand upon in a moment. While we explain later how to identify the four major tissue types, each of the remaining levels is simple to make comparisons to with common knowledge. Different combinations of tissues create a structure called an organ, which also serves a specific purpose or purposes within a system to help an organism survive. For example, multiple tissues make up an internal organ we call the stomach. The stomach is just one organ within the digestive system that allows for breakdown of food into energy. Without food and energy, an organism would not be able to maintain homeostasis, a sustainable equilibrium of processes necessary for survival. Before going in-depth into tissue types and homeostasis, it might be beneficial to familiarize yourself with the terminology related to describing body parts. Let's begin with the body regions and planes. Look at the human body here. Note how the body is standing, face and feet forward, with arms down by the side and palms facing forward as well. This is considered the anatomical position. From it, we can logically determine each of these four regions, the upper and lower limbs, and the central and head regions. Keeping this view of the human body in mind, we want to imagine that there are these planes which divide the regions into halves, or left and right sides, in order to make clear and defined anatomical references. Looking at this green, or transverse plane, we can see that this plane runs parallel to the ground and divides the body into upper and lower portions. In this diagram specifically, the transverse plane divides the upper and lower limbs. Does a transverse plane have to divide the body at this point? No. As long as the plane runs parallel to the ground and divides the body into an upper and lower portion, it will still be transverse. For example, a transverse plane can run parallel to the ground at the knee level dividing the leg into the upper thigh portion and lower shin and foot portion. Opposite the transverse plane is the sagittal plane, which divides the body not into upper and lower, but rather left and right sides. Looking at our diagram, this pink sagittal plane separates the body into left and right sides exactly in the middle, making it a mid-sagittal plane, because the division provides two equal halves. 
Lastly, we have this blue coronal plane. Similar to the sagittal plane, it is a vertical division of the body. But instead of dividing the body into left and right, it divides the body into front and back. If it's difficult to imagine, let's look at the coronal plane from this alternate view. If we look at this diagram of the body from the side, or lateral view, we would imagine that the plane is running left to right along this vertical edge. As a result, it separates the front of the body, say where you'd locate your nose, from the back of the body where you would locate your gluteal region, or simply put, your butt. While we have this image up, take a moment to refer to the body cavities as they relate. We just said that the coronal plane separates the front and the back of the body, but using your terminology chart, we can recognize that there are more correctly considered the dorsal versus ventral regions. This makes sense when we identify that the dorsal body cavity is the back of our body and can be further separated into the cranial and vertebral cavity. Logically thinking, your brain, or cranium, is the cranial portion, while the spine, made up of many vertebra, make up the vertebral cavity. Other important notes about this diagram would be to recognize that the diaphragm is not considered a cavity, but the separation point between the thoracic and abdominal cavity. Let's continue to use this diagram to understand more of our terminology chart. It can be useful to couple off these terms in order to understand them best. While we've covered many of these terms through our planes discussion, let's review. A transverse plane divides the body into an upper and lower portion. In other words, an inferior and superior portion. The coronal plane divides the body into a ventral, or front portion, and dorsal, back portion. Similarly, if we use that same plane and discuss movement towards the front, it would be considered anterior, while going in the direction towards the back would be posterior. Skipping down to the terms superficial and deep, we can understand these by recognizing the depth to the human body. For example, we can imagine that the heart is located in the thoracic cavity here. The heart is protected by bones in the chest region, such as the sternum and rib cage. These bones are considered more superficial or closer to the surface than the heart, deep in comparison, which is protected behind such bones. Going back to our planes image, we can associate our mid-sagittal plane with simple references of going towards the middle, midline, or medially versus laterally, or away from the midline. Anterior superior is simply opposite the midline, similar to anterior movement or superior movement. Refer to your text for the complete breakdown and further familiarize yourself with anatomical terminology. For now, let's continue with our conversation regarding tissue types. As we have said before, our breakdown of each level of organization can be further subcategorized. While cells may be packed together to comprise a tissue, there are four primary tissue types. The following chart provides a complete breakdown of the structure and function for each type which can be found in your text. But let's examine these images to see if we can identify the structure and thus function. Look at this image of connective tissue. According to our chart, connective tissue can be characterized by extracellular material. So looking at the image, you can see all of this extra space between the cells, which shows that while the cells are connected, they are not densely packed together. Now consider what the function of connective tissue is. It's in the name, right? Connect. Connective tissue has a variety of purposes because it has the space within its structure to be utilized in many different ways. They are meant to connect tissues together along with other relative purposes, enclosing and separating specific structures, protecting, cushioning, or insulating, which can be carried out with all of the extra space. For example, connective tissue such as blood can serve these purposes because of its space and quantity. Blood has the potential to carry oxygen throughout the body and deliver it to different systems as it is needed to keep the body functioning constantly. Without blood to connect all of our internal systems, we could not survive. Now let's look at this image of epithelial tissue. It looks like there's still a lot of space in between the cells, doesn't it? That can be explained because epithelial tissue also serves a purpose to protect underlying structures. So how can you tell the difference? Epithelial tissues serve a more specialized purpose to act as barriers which can secrete substances and allow them to pass through their membranes. As a result, epithelial tissues can be classified and identified according to the number of layers it has as well as their shapes. But let's think of a specific example. The skin is very tough tissue that not only protects all of our internal body parts, but still allows for substances such as sweat to pass through. 
When looking at the skin, it is considered a stratified squamous epithelial tissue because there are identifiable multiple layers of square-shaped cells which provide the necessary protection but still allowing for the passage of specific substances. At first glance, muscle and nervous tissue are a little simpler to identify. What do muscles do? Provide movement. So logically thinking, muscle tissue has this function. When looking at the structure of muscle tissue, the cells are packed together tightly into long threads referred to as fibers. These give our muscles that potential to stretch and elongate in order to move our bones while also staying compact and rigid. Thinking about it, if you press on the upper portion of your arm, your bicep muscle gives way to the pressure of your hand. But if you flex that muscle, you're activating that muscle by contracting the fibers. That muscle can be sustained through the action of flexing, but it also helps you use the bones and other surrounding structures to say, lift a heavy box. Looking at this final image of nervous tissue, it ironically seems a little nerve wracking. It looks like a jumbled mess of stuff. Perhaps that can be used to your advantage in identifying it. If you recall that the nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord, it's easy to make the connection that the nervous system is pretty complex. It involves the brain, which has many different areas that work together to help coordinate and control bodily activities, whether or not it's conscious. When we consider this, that happens to be the major function of nervous tissue. In order to carry out this function, nervous tissue consists of neurons, which you can identify here. These structures are uniquely purposeful because their anatomy allow them to connect one another through dendrites and axon terminals in order to transmit messages at an intense rate so that the information from the brain can almost instantaneously relay information to the body so it can move or react in a specific way. These signals can majorly influence feedback mechanisms. Earlier, we described homeostasis as processes which keep the body at an equilibrium for survival. The human body has both negative and positive feedback systems that take different conditions and factors into account to keep the body performing ideally. When the body attempts to maintain homeostasis by resisting a change in a functional level for a body system, it is considered a negative feedback system. Alternatively, a positive feedback system is not a mechanism for maintaining homeostasis because the body will only make the change away from homeostatic levels greater. In many cases, this presents to be very unsafe. Let's look at a few examples. The human body has ideal blood pressure levels. Blood pressure is influenced by a variety of health and body factors, but is considered a negative feedback system because when the body's blood pressure changes, whether an increase or a decrease, the body will try and moderate that change and return back to its normal blood pressure for homeostasis. So what if something is wrong in our system and our blood cannot be delivered properly to the cardiac muscle? Our blood pressure may rise or fall, but the variation away from homeostasis is only continuing to increase. This is considered positive feedback as the body status only changes continually while the malfunction prevents the body from returning to homeostatic levels.